All right, so now uh, we can uh, move on to the uh, next sutta. And uh, just uh, again, just to kind of remind you what is going on here, the idea is that we are trying to follow what the Buddha did, yeah, or the Buddha to be, what he did in his practice. Uh, and we have been focusing on the idea of right view so far, how the Buddha to be viewed the world, uh, and then what made him go forth uh, and become a monastic based on that right view. Uh, and now we're going to start to look more at the practical side. Based on that right view, what happens? Well, the first thing that happens is, of course, that the Buddha goes forth. Uh, he becomes a monastic. Uh, we know that from the uh, biography of the Buddha, the autobiography, how he decides to go forth. Uh, and then once he's gone forth, of course, he starts his practice. Uh, and this next sutta is very much based on how the Buddha was practicing uh, at the time after he went forth. Uh, there are a few suttas about that. One of the suttas uh, that I haven't included this time is called the Dveda Vitaka Suttas on the two kinds of thought, uh, which also is a very beautiful sutta, but I can't do the same suttas every time, so I decided to leave that one out. Uh, instead, I'm going to focus on the sutta, which I have not talked about before, and this is this sutta here called Fear and Dread, uh, the Bhaya Bhairava Sutta found in the uh, Majjhima Nikaya number four, the fourth sutta of the middle length sayings of the Buddha. And uh, the Buddha talks about some of the striving and some of the dedication that he had on the path uh, uh, before his awakening. Uh, and this is what this is about. So uh, uh, let's see what happens. Uh, let's see what we can get out of this particular sutta. So as always, it starts off with uh, Thus have I heard, or so have I heard, uh, which is the uh, idea that this has been passed down in oral transmission. Uh, just to be clear where we are in this little booklet, we are on page 18 in this little booklet, uh, in case you have any doubt. Uh, so. Um, so, so have I heard. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's grove, another Pindika's monastery. Then the Brahmin Janusoni went up to the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. Janusoni was one of the famous Brahmins in Savati. He was one of the chaplains, or one of the Brahmins of the king. And so the king relied a lot on this Brahmin Janusoni. And he was a very staunch Buddhist, this Janusoni, and he often went to the Buddha, many conversations between him and the Buddha found in the suttas. They exchanged greetings. When the greetings and polite conversation were over, he sat down to one side and said to the Buddha. So always a bit of greetings and polite conversation first, so everyone is nice and relaxed. Yeah, a couple of jokes probably in there, thrown in there, maybe, I don't know, uh, possibly. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so uh, then what did he say? He said the following, yeah. Master Gautama, those gentlemen who have gone forth from the lay life to homelessness out of faith in Master Gautama, have Master Gautama to lead the way, help them and give them encouragement to. Yeah, again, you have this idea of going forth out of faith. You don't go forth out of any reason, but you go forth out of faith. You really think that there's something powerful going on here. You have confidence in these teachings. There's a real going forth. It's not some kind of spurious reason, but you have a real reason for going forth. And because of that, you have the Buddha to lead the way, Pubangama is the Pali word here, to lead the way. In other words, the Buddha goes first, right? Uh, uh, the Buddha to help them, uh, Bahukaro, someone who does much for another, Bahukaro, you see down here. And, um, uh, and um, uh, he gives them encouragement, uh, Samadha Peta means to encourage somebody. And those people follow Master Gautama's example. Yeah, this is this last thing down the bottom here, you follow the example of Master Gautama. So again, this is what I have been talking about all the time, 
and when we talk about the life of the Buddha prior to his awakening, uh, the idea of talking about this uh, is the idea that we learn from how the Buddha to be practiced, uh, the idea is we want to practice in the same way. Uh, yeah? So the Buddha is actually the example for us. Uh, he is not just some kind of elevated person who is unreachable by ordinary people. Uh, no, his way of practice is actually the example of every one of us. Uh, and this is kind of the purpose of this way of uh, uh, looking at the suttas. Uh, That is so true, Brahmin. Everything you say is true, Brahmin. <laughs> it's the, it's, this is Bhantasujato's translation. Sometimes I, <laughs> it's kind of kind of interesting. It's a different way of, of uh, translating. Yeah, Eva metang Brahmana, Eva metang. So it is, Brahmin. So it is. That would be a, a more literal translation. <laughs> So, and then he goes on, uh, but Master Gautama, this is the Brahmin Janasoni speaking, remote lodgings in the wilderness and the forest are challenging here. It is hard to maintain seclusion and hard to find joy in solitude. Yeah, and uh, this is kind of an important point. I think it's kind of obvious to anyone who has tried this. Uh, remote lodgings in the wilderness, if you live way off in the wilderness somewhere, away from civilization, it's kind of difficult. Yeah, The Pali word here uh, is dur ambisambhavani, hard to exist or something like that is the, what it means. Uh, hard to exist on those uh, lodgings. Yeah, lodging here is basically just a resting place in the forest. Uh, is really what it means. Uh, it is hard to maintain seclusion and hard to find joy in solitude. Uh, can you rejoice in solitude? Uh, can you rejoice in staying completely by yourself in the forest uh, and the only company are snakes and mosquitoes? Uh, <laughs> makes it even worse, right? If you're just the only company you have are snakes and mosquitoes. Uh, and of course the point here is that uh, the whole point of seclusion is to find happiness in it, is to enjoy it. Uh, that's kind of the point. Uh, and uh, the idea here is that when you have samadhi, uh, samadhi is something you practice in seclusion. Uh, uh, and the more people are around you, the more likely you are to lose that samadhi. So once you get to the point of samadhi, that's when you start to enjoy the practice of seclusion. Uh, this is the, what this is all about here. This is why we're talking about these things. Uh, that's when you can enjoy these things. Uh, um, yeah, this, this is uh, the, the, the story of this uh, monk in Sri Lanka. He was a European monk, and he he was very super. He, just recently died and he was very famous in Sri Lanka. He looks like one of these ancient arahants when you see him. And he, um, he w built this three-walled kutis, uh, a hut with three walls. And the idea of having three walls, that, then it feels a bit like a cave, right? Uh, if you have one opening wall, it's like a cave. Uh, the problem with missing one wall uh, is that when you're sleeping at night, all the animals come in there. Uh, yeah? So when you wake up in the morning, there's a kind of a snake sleeping next to you. Uh, yeah? Apparently this happened to him all the time, the snake, oh, good morning, Mr. Snake, <laughs> yeah, and you kind of wake up. So when I say that you literally live with the snakes and mosquitoes, actually that's literally true. That's what happens when you live in these kind of forest lodgings. So, so uh, that's kind of interesting. Are you ready? Are you ready for that? No? Okay. <laughs> Not ready for that. Okay. So maybe don't, don't go to those forests. Uh, go to another forest. Come, come to the Australian forest. Australian forest is not so dangerous. Uh, Come to kind of Janna Grove. Start slowly, gradually, gradually moving in that direction. Huh? Have, have many of you here been to Janna Grove before? Huh? Yeah? Some of you, I know some of you have. Huh? Yeah? Many of you have not been to Janna Grove? Huh? No? Okay, no, no. Okay. So uh, there's that, there is the opportunity for you. That, that's already in the forest. Uh, compared to this, this is like really in the middle of the city. Janna Grove is like a forest resort compared to this. Uh, uh, very, uh, this, is, this is also very nice, I must say. It's actually a quite nice place, but it still is in the middle of the city. It doesn't have that feeling of solitude in the same way. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. The forest seems to rob the mind of a mendicant who isn't immersed in samadhi. Yeah, or quite literally, Pali says, who does not gain samadhi. Gaining alabamanasa, alabha is to gain or to acquire uh, samadhi. So... Uh, 
this is the problem, right? Uh, that if you're not ready for these seclusions in the forest, uh, you're going to go crazy here. You're going to go nuts. You're going to lose your mind. The mind is going to get robbed. And the, you don't want to have your mind robbed. It's very handy to have a good mind. Otherwise, you have a problem here. And this is a very important point. And what that means is that you shouldn't really go into this very severe solitude until you have a decent samadhi experience. That's when your mind is ready. Why? Because the mind is unbiased. The mind is clear. The mind uh, is not kind of... Um, it, it does not delude it anymore. Yeah, this is kind of when you come out of delusion. So you're able to deal with the reality as it actually is. So what does the Buddha say? That is so true, Brahmin. Everything you say is true. Before my awakening, yeah, before my awakening, when I was still unawakened, but intent on awakening, I too thought. Remote lodgings in the wilderness and the forest are challenging. It is hard to maintain seclusion, hard to find joy in solitude. The forest seemed to rob the mind of a mendicant who, is, who doesn't attain or achieve samadhi. The Buddha had exactly the same thoughts. Yeah, Again, you see the humanity of the Buddha again, that he basically facing the same problems as everyone else. Then I thought the Buddha to be him. There are ascetics and Brahmins with unpurified conduct of body, speech and mind who frequent remote lodgings in the wilderness and the forests. Those ascetics and Brahmins, they summon unskillful fear and dread because of these defects in their conduct. So, uh, the reflection of the Buddha here is that if you are not pure in your conduct by body, speech and mind, then you have a problem. Yeah, we're going into the forest. And of course, someone who doesn't have samadhi, the reason they haven't got samadhi is because they have some defect in their conduct somewhere. That's exactly why you don't achieve samadhi, the deep meditations. So, uh, what, why is this a problem? And the reason it is a problem is because the mind is kind of still deluded. The mind is not clear. And when the mind is deluded, it creates problems when, where there are no problems. And specifically in this case, if you are unpurified in your conduct, it means you have some bad conduct or whatever. Uh, one of the things that happens when you have bad conduct is that you tend to see that bad conduct that you have. You tend to also project that onto the world around you. The way you behave towards the world is how you experience the world behaving towards you. Yeah, if you are a person with bad conduct, you tend to think of other people as treating you in the same way. And this is one of the scary things about not being pure in conduct, is that you tend to view the world as frightening precisely because of that. You project onto the world how you experience the world. And of course, if you are living remotely in the forest, your conduct isn't pure, then the forest is going to seem scary because you're going to be afraid that the forest is going to do things to you. And you can imagine that night, we're going to see this later on, I don't know if you have ever been in the forest at night by yourself. Have you been in the forest at night by yourself? It's very interesting. I, I'm like this all the time because I live in a small kuti in Bodhinyana Monastery. Yeah, I can't see anyone. When I go out at night, there's no one around. And actually, it's interesting because some of the sounds in the forest get amplified at night. Daytime you hardly hear it, but at night you really hear it, right? Uh, because your mind is really kind of attuning to those things. Uh, and things that in daytime, yeah, that's, that's the bird or whatever, at night, is it a bird or is it something else? Yeah? Everything changes because you, because you hear things in, in a different way. And the more you have of these defilements in the mind, uh, the more unsure you are about these things. Uh. And one of the strange things about Australia is that in Australia, we have lots of kangaroos, right? Those of you who have been to Australia, you know, you know all the kangaroos down there. You know what it's like. Uh, and when the kangaroo is walking, uh, sounds like a human being. Uh. <laughs> because they, when they jump, no. But when they walk, they sound like a human being. Uh. So at night, you go out, the kangaroo is walking. You think, oh, human being coming here uh, straight away. Actually, no, it's just a kangaroo. Uh. So this is what your mind starts to play with you 
at night, right? Uh, he starts to play with your senses. And the more you have of unskillful conduct in your mind, uh, the more uh, the mind plays with you and kind of creates things out of nothing. And that's why you have this fear and dread at night when your conduct is bad. You are deluded. You cr the mind creates things because of the delusion. If you have samadhi, delusion is gone. You don't, the mind doesn't create things any anymore. You hear what is actually there. And that is why you have no fear even at night in the forest. So all of these Brahmins and the people who live in the forest, unpurified in conduct, uh, they will have fear and dread. So if you want to come and live in the forest, uh, yeah, if you want to come and become a nun or a monk at Bodhinana Monastery, uh, and if you want to be able to really relax, be as pure in your conduct as you can be, then you can relax. Yeah, wow, no problems. Uh, I'm enjoying. And it's actually beautiful to live in the forest like that. Uh, the forest in Australia is much more, um, kind of, much less dangerous than the forest here. Yeah? The, f the jungle here is, feels a bit more dangerous. Uh, in Australia it's very kind of open and, you know, uh, and does, doesn't feel, feel quite the same as the jungle. Uh, uh, so uh, I think you probably enjoy it, yeah, living by yourself. Uh, you think you'll enjoy it, uh, living by yourself, yeah? It's, kind of, kind of, it's actually very nice. Uh, you get used to it very quickly. After a while you don't want to do anything else. You just want to be in the forest. Uh, don't have anything to do with the city life, yeah? Ah, city dwellers, <laughs> all the city slickers. <laughs> no, I'm being very naughty. I just, uh, uh, it actually is very beautiful to live in the forest by itself. I can really recommend it. And sometimes it depends how you are brought up. I know Adam Brahm always says that in, uh, in Thailand, the Thai people are often brought up on a diet of ghost stories. Uh, is that true, Venerable? Yeah. Thai people hear, hear lots of ghost stories when they are children, yeah? So when they become monastics and they have to live by themselves, oh, sometimes they're very scared because they, they expect to see ghosts everywhere, right? Uh, but uh, in the West, you never hear ghost stories when you're a child. You just, uh, you know, it's, it's very different. So because of different conditioning, uh, you have a different reaction to living in the forest. Uh. You have a ghost, uh, right? Okay, so you have a ghost anyways. Okay, good. Uh. Is it a ni nice ghost? Is it friendly? Does it has it <laughs> sometimes? Uh, has it hurt? Has it hurt you yet? Uh, give it hurt you in any way? Uh, no, not 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 yet. Uh, Did it kill anyone? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that means you have to have pure conduct, right? Because if your conduct is not pure, then the ghost might uh, do. They like you. Okay. Okay. They like you. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They chase them away for you. That is you. You are very lucky. You have like like a like a kind of anti burglar ghost. Yeah. <laughs> the ghost keeps the burglars away. That's very fortunate. So that's very 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 handy. Yeah. So. Okay, that's very smart having a ghost for a guard. That's really that's really wise. Yeah, the the Bikinis are really kind of wise about these things. So, so <laughs> okay, so this is the first thing. Yeah, so you should not have that bad conduct. And then the Buddha says, he says, but I do not frequent remote resting places in the wilderness and the forest with unpurified conduct of body, speech, and mind. My conduct is purified. I am one of those noble ones who frequent remote lodgings in the wilderness and the forest with purified conduct by body, speech, and mind. So he doesn't have anything to worry about. And we can see here how he calls himself a noble one already, even though he's not an arahant yet, he hasn't gone to the end of the path, but here is noble in a slightly different way of the term. Noble in the sense of someone who is striving in a good way and living a righteous life. Yeah, so if you, your conduct by body, speech, and mind is pure, you are in business. You can come to ordain at the Bodhinyana Monastery, the Masara Monastery at any time, and you will be okay. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah. seeing this purity of a conduct in myself, I felt even more unruffled about staying in the forest. Yeah, more at ease, no problems, not worried about staying in the forest anymore. 
Now the way the Buddha stayed in forest is actually quite scary. We'll see this later on. He he didn't kind of hold back. Yeah, he really went for it uh, all the way. So uh, we'll come to this further down. Uh, then I thought uh, there are ascetics and Brahmins with unpurified livelihood uh, who frequent remote lodgings in the wilderness in the forest. Uh, those ascetics and Brahmins summon unskillful fear and dread because of those defects in their livelihood. Uh, so uh, because you have a wrong livelihood, yeah, the idea as a monastic uh, is that you're supposed to live on arms. Uh, you're not supposed to practice as a doctor, not supposed to practice as a messenger and all of these kind of things, but you're supposed to just live off the arms of the lay people. And if you live because you want to do Feng Shui, yeah, I'm going to teach you how to build, build your building in the right place with the doors and the face in the right direction, these kind of things, or you know, whatever else it is that you might, and this, I'm not joking, this Feng Shui is also, you don't find the word Feng Shui, of course, but you find similar words in the suttas, uh, that uh, monastics do all kind of weird things uh, to uh, earn a livelihood, and a lot of it has to do with uh, omen, omens and kind of predicting the future and that kind of thing. Yeah. Of course, you can imagine if you do that, you know that you are cheating a little bit, and if you're cheating a little bit, you're not going to feel really fully worthy of that support. Uh, and because you don't feel very fully worthy, uh, you're going to feel a bit bad about yourself in the forest. You're gonna, the mind is going to start playing tricks on you again. Uh. So this is a bad idea, having the wrong livelihood. But I don't frequent remote lodgings in the wilderness and forest with unpurified livelihood. Uh. My livelihood is purified. I'm one of those noble ones who frequent lodgings in the forest with purified livelihood. Seeing the purity of livelihood in myself, I felt even more unruffled about staying in the forest. All right. Then I thought there are ascetics and Brahmins full of desire for sensual pleasures, like for the five sense world, right? With acute desire. Tibba raga is the Pali word. Tibba means like strong desire. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, yeah, this means that you have a very strong vested interest in the world around you. You want to seek pleasure in that world. Uh, and again, that's going to make you vulnerable when that world around you does not give you those pleasures. Uh, uh, once you want pleasures from that world, you're also going to be fearful of the downsides, the dangers in that world of the five senses. Uh, and so because of that, you're going to feel more vulnerable in the forest, right? It's kind of automatic. Yeah? So you have to give up the strong desires. You notice here, it's only the strong desires that I talked about here. The weak desires, presumably the Buddha-to-be still has some of those weaker desires. Because otherwise he would already be an arahant if he didn't have those. I'm not full of desire. Yeah? There are ascetics and Brahmins full of ill will with malicious intentions. And you can imagine if you have a lot of ill will, it is a very bad idea to live by yourself. Because that ill will is really going to play with you. Yeah? And it's going to be incredibly scary. If you have ill will towards the world, you're going to feel like the world has ill will towards you. Those sounds in the forest are really going to be amplified and you're going to feel incredibly scared when you have ill will like that in the forest. So this is, uh, this is always a very dangerous thing. And after a while, you start to go crazy, basically, quite literally, if you have a lot of ill will. The mind becomes very distorted and goes really bad if that happens. But the Buddha says, the Buddha-to-be, I have a heart full of love, or loving kindness. Metta, citta is the Pali word here. There are ascetics and Brahmins overcome with dullness and drowsiness. You can see we're dealing with the five hindrances here. Yeah? one after the other. But I'm free from dullness and drowsiness. When the mind is dull, it is not really capable of seeing things properly and clearly, so you have a problem. Huh? Ascetics and Brahmins who are restless with no peace of mind. My mind is peaceful. When the mind is restless, again, it has all kinds of imagination and things going on, huh? and it creates stuff out of things that don't actually exist. Ascetics and Brahmins who are doubting and uncertain. But I have gone beyond doubt. 
Yeah, if you have doubt, that's obviously a bad idea when you are hanging out far away in the forest somewhere. Yeah. There are ascetics and Brahmins who glorify themselves uh, and put others down. Uh. Yeah, praise yourself and disparage others, is another translation here. Uh. But I don't glorify myself and put others down. Uh. Yeah, so. Um, this is one of those things. This is very often the ego who wants to do, wants to do this. If you glorify yourself, you put other people down. Uh, remember the Buddha's teachings about the three kinds of conceit. Uh, the uh, no, uh, superior, superiority conceit, the inferiority conceit, and the equality conceit. Uh, there is no basis for comparing ourselves to others. Uh, you should never think of yourself as better. Never think of yourself as worse. Uh, there's no basis for putting anyone in this world down. Uh, in fact, the noble ones, people like the Buddha, even though the Buddha clearly is superior, uh, the Buddha never glorifies himself and puts other people down. Yeah? This is one of the qualities of someone who is superior. They don't do that. Uh. So if you really are superior, you don't do these things. Uh. The sign that you glorify yourself means, in fact, that you are not superior straight away. Uh. That is a sign that you don't have that superiority. Uh. So this means that you shouldn't be doing it because it's... It shows that you have got things wrong. So, remember this. It's a very important. It's very. It's something people often ask me. They say, you know, well, when we are, uh, you know, when we see other people doing bad things and we have compassion for them, uh, very often we feel superior because we feel better. Yeah, you see this person doing many bad things, and I have compassion for them. It means I feel good about myself because they are bad, and I am the one who has compassion, and they are inferior. Uh, but that is the wrong way to think about it. Uh, just because someone else happens to be a person with many bad qualities, and maybe right now you have better qualities, uh, it's always rem important to remember that these things change very fast. Uh, and tomorrow it may be the other way around. They may have the good qualities, you may have the bad ones. Uh, and if not tomorrow, maybe next year, or maybe next life, or maybe last life, or whatever. Things are always changing. Uh, never feel superior just because someone else has many bad qualities. Uh, yeah, things change, things move around, uh, nothing is stable in this world. Uh, never glorify yourself, never put other people down, uh, never put yourself down either. Uh, many people put themselves down, they don't have enough self-esteem, not enough sense of self-worth. Uh, you are all wonderful people, yeah, uh, you're all doing your best. Uh, the very fact that you are coming here, you're trying to do your best, means that you are worthy of self-esteem. You're worthy of respect because of that. Uh, so respect yourself because of what you're doing. Uh, and even if you fail in every single precept, <laughs> and that, that, that's not going to happen, right? But even if you do that, you're still worthy of respect because uh, you are trying. Uh, and this is kind of the point here. Uh. So uh, get out of this whole idea of glorifying yourself. Get out of the whole comparison business. No need for any kind of comparison. Comparison is silly. Uh. Okay, let's take a five minute break at this point. I think this is a good place to take a quick break. Yeah. So uh, let's do some meditation together.
Okay. Mm. All right, so any uh, comments or questions, please? Everyone okay? Uh, over here, there's a couple of questions. Okay, at the back there, yeah, please. Hi, good afternoon, Ajahn. Yeah. Um, the question is, um, how do one get out of a victim mindset um, if this person truly believes that um, they've gone through a tough experience and people are unfair to them, mm. and in their deluded mind, mm. that is their reality, and they have become a victim mm. all their life, um, how do you basically get out of that mindset? Thank you. Okay. okay. So yeah, it is not a, it's not a very skillful way of dealing with things to think of yourself as a victim. I mean, in some cases, people are kind of victims because they're, of course, sometimes people get bullied or they get hurt or they get abused, and this this is also happens in the world. But uh, usually, usually, it is better to kind of take charge of your life rather than think of yourself as a victim. Huh? And uh, the, um, the, uh, the answer is always the Buddhist idea that to remember that other people don't know what they're doing here. Yeah, it's like uh, being, if you are a victim of a mosquito, it's very diff different to, to being a victim of a human being, right? Uh, because a mosquito is like, they don't know what they're doing anyway, a mosquito is just biting you. Uh, but actually human beings are just like mosquitoes. Uh. And that is the right way of thinking about it. Human beings don't know what they are doing here. Uh, they are doing things because of their conditioning, because of their background, uh, and you happen to be where that other person is, and so you become the victim because you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, the whole idea is to learn to see people in a new way, uh, to see them more like mosquitoes, more like red traffic lights, more like robots than actually as beings that deliberately hurt others. Uh, if you see that the other person is deliberately hurting you, that they decide, they choose to hurt you, you're always going to feel like a victim because it feels like you are trapped by this person. Huh? But if you think of them as a robot uh, or as a machine or a red traffic light, uh, then you, um, uh, first of all, it enables you to see them with more compassion and understanding that actually they, have a, they are the ones who have a problem rather than you because they are the ones who are mistreating you. Huh? You don't really have a problem. They are the ones because they are trapped in this kind of way. Huh? But the second thing it allows you to do, it allows, it makes it easier for you to walk away, yeah, to do, to do something else, rather than allowing yourself to be trapped in that kind of situation. So if you really do feel like you are a victim, it is okay to walk away from difficult situations in life, right? It is okay to be a bit assertive. I remember yesterday we had a, they had a, someone chatting very quietly over there, and I said to them, can you please be quiet? And uh, they felt really bad about that, and I, I'm sorry that I made, I didn't really want it to make you feel bad, uh, because, it, you know, we have different perceptions of reality. They thought they were not being noisy, and I thought they were being a bit noisy, so we had different perceptions of things. Uh, but it's okay to be a little bit assertive and to take charge of your life in that way, and say, you know, please. Uh, so sometimes if you feel you're a victim, you just have to walk away from that situation. Uh, yeah. If you are married to someone who really is abusive, you should end that marriage. You shouldn't allow it to continue. Because that is just, you're not really taking responsibility for yourself in that situation. It can be very hard to walk away, but sometimes you have no choice. So you, on the one hand, you take responsibility for yourself, and you know what you should be doing to have a better life. On the other hand, you start to see the other person in a different way, more like a machine than a human being. And these two things together take a responsibility for yourself, for your own life, and also understanding other people in a new way. When you bring those two things together, it's a powerful combination that can help you resolve difficult situations like that. So this is the beginning, but it's, you know, they have to believe these things, yeah, to be able to kind of bring them out of that. They have to actually accept that kind of way of thinking about the world. And then there's a chance maybe that they can move in a direction. They, other things you can do is see some kind of counselor, yeah, some kind of counselor who can counsel you in the right way, huh? and uh, that may also be something useful to to do. Huh? Do 
Do you want to get back on that one? Or are you satisfied with that? Or not satisfied? Or neutral? Or uh, both satisfied and not satisfied? Neither satisfied and not satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> satisfied? But um, what if, um, yeah. Ajahn, um, if it's a karmic tie towards that person and if you run away, would you not be running away from something you're supposed to experience? <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is no such thing as supposed to be experienced. There's no such thing. Maybe the beginning of the relationship is from karma. It is possible that the reason why you got into that is because of karma, but if you can get out of it, uh, it's because of good karma that you can get out of it. So, of course, you should try to get out of it if you can. Sometimes people say, oh, you know, I'm getting sick, I should just allow this to happen and take its course because I'm sick, it's karma, so it, I should just, uh, you know, stay with it. Or, or I have a terminal illness, you know, I should just kind of live with the terminal illness and kind of allow things to be because it's karma. Uh, or I should not... Uh, of these we talk about euthanasia, of assisted suicide. Oh, I shouldn't do that because I should allow things to take its course because of karma. But we never do that. If you break a leg, you don't say, I shouldn't go, go to the doctor and fix it. Uh, yeah, because it's karma, I should let it be. We never think like that. Of course you go to the doctor. Uh, you put a, car, you know, a thing on your, a cast on your leg and so you kind of get it sorted out again. Of course you do that. Uh, so the ability to counter whatever is happening, that's also karma. It's a good karma. Yeah, you have that opportunity to fix things up. So it's the idea that you should just let things be is not really a Buddhism at all. You should, of course, you should do everything you can to sort it out. That's the Buddhist way. Yeah? You take responsibility, you use the opportunities that are available to get things sorted out. That is the right way of looking at things. Yeah. Yeah. Please, uh, I have yeah. questions regarding this sutta. Um, uh, regarding the, uh, I think when it comes to downness and uh, drowsiness, right? I, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure how it actually prevents one from staying secluded and uh, enjoying, uh, how to say, seclusion. Because, I mean, from my personal experience, wouldn't it be much more better when you you're I mean, when you are in the forest and you feel sleepy all the time, and the fresh air is very refreshing for, to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's good to sleep, but you don't want to sleep all the time. Yeah, that's that's the problem. If you sleep all the time, you have a problem. You have to have the point of being in the forest is to gain clarity of mind. The point of being in the forest is to gain mindfulness. It's to gain samadhi. And if you have a lot of dullness and drowsiness, you're not really doing that. If you practice samadhi, you don't have much dullness and drowsiness at all. The mind is usually very clear. Maybe a little bit after the meal, a little bit at night when you sleep, but then you wake up, and as soon as you wake up, your mind is clear again. You don't kind of walk around like in a cloud all the time. Yeah? Some people are always drowsy and dull. Yeah? That's kind of the way some people are. So uh, it's a kind of a state of delusion if you ha have that all the time. And that state of delusion is going to make living in the forest difficult because that's what delusion does. Uh. But, but it, it, it wouldn't actually cause, uh, uh, how to say, the feeling of fear and worry as, as stated in Sutta, right? Well, it probably will because you are deluded. Huh? Yeah, the mind is kind of deluded. The mind isn't clear. You're not able to see those sounds and weird things in the forest clearly. The mind will confabulate. It will make things out of it because you are dull. The mind will not actually be able to see them clearly, basically. Huh? Yeah, so that will, it will lead to problems, quite likely. Huh? And very often the dullness and drowsiness, often it is caused by deeper defilements, often it is caused by um, craving for sensual things, caused by ill will very often. Huh? This, these things often lead to that dullness and drowsiness anyway. So often there is a kind of a more deep-seated problem there as well at the same time. Huh? Okay, yeah. thank you, yeah. Ajahn. Yeah. All right, let's carry on a little bit. Huh? So let's continue with some of these uh, various defilements. Uh, there are ascetics and Brahmins who are cowardly and craven. craven. Uh, the Pali words are chambi and uh, birukajatika. And uh, basically these words mean means like you are fearful and scared kind of person. That's really what they mean. And of course, if you are fearful and scared, of course, being in the forest is going to be make it worse. Yeah, 
So if you already have a tendency towards fear, you have a problem already. And it's going to be amplified in the forest. So you don't want to be too much of a fearful character. It's pretty, this is a very high standard. Yeah? You have to be very pure to live in the forest. Uh, none of these defilements are really useful. And the Buddha says, I do not get startled. In other words, I do not kind of have that fear. Yeah? There are ascetics and Brahmins who enjoy possessions, honor, and popularity. Labha, Sakara, Siloka. So, again, this is a kind of desire that you have in the forest. Your mind wants all of these kind of things. You are still attached to the world. You want to get something out of the world. And uh, because you are attached to the world, get, wanting to get things out of the world, the downside is also there. You're going to be scared when the world doesn't give you those things. Uh, this is the Pali word over here. Yeah? Laba sakara siloka. Laba is kind of gain, yeah? this possessions. Sakara here is, uh, oop, go away. Sakara is this one here. It's like uh, honor, uh, people honoring you. And siloka is like fame or popularity at the end there. Laba sakara siloka, one of these famous compounds in the suttas. So you don't want to be too worried about those things. You don't want to be too um, too kind of um, attached to the idea of other people honoring you and being popular with other people. This should not be important. It's kind of interesting in the suttas, the Buddha calls this the kind of the uh, the dung happiness. Yeah, If you are interested in honor and these things, it's called the dung happiness that you get. So, dung happiness, not uh, recommended there. Dung, dung, I don't know. Dung, cow dung can be used for him. But uh, don't, want too, don't want too much of it. Dung, dung is very useful if you are a beetle, a dung beetle. Yeah. For fuel, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, but not here, right? So, this is Malaysia. So, we. we in Malaysia, dung happiness. So. <laughs> La basakara siloka. But I have few wishes. In other words, you have no wishes for these things. This is what the Buddha to be says. There are ascetics and Brahmins who are lazy and lacking in energy. If you are lazy and lacking in energy, your mind is not really clear, you're not alert, you're not kind of practicing and exerting yourself, not really interest in the spiritual life, but I am energetic. So now we are moving on to the five spiritual faculties. Energy is one of the five spiritual faculties. So we have seen just before the five hindrances, and now we're going on to the spiritual faculties. And the, So part of the idea here is that you are lacking in the defilements of the mind, which is the uh, five hindrances, uh, but you have the opposite of the defilements. The opposite of the defilements are like the spiritual faculties, that are the powers of the mind that enables the mind to practice the spiritual path and endure difficulties. Uh, it is similar to the seven factors of awakening, but a slightly different angle on these things. So energy, mindfulness, samadhi, and wisdom, and all of these are mentioned here. We'll see that now in a second. When you have these things, they fortify the mind, they strengthen the mind, and enable it to deal with difficulties. That's why they are mentioned in this way here. Brahmins who are unmindful and lacking in situational awareness. Yeah, situational awareness is uh, sampajanya. And uh, so you have here, you have here, mutta, mutta sati is uh, being unmindful, or being muddle-minded, or being absent-minded. And then you have asampajanya over here. Yeah? So uh, these are the, uh, the words here. So lacking, being muddle-minded, it means that you don't, lacking in clarity is obviously going to be difficult. And lacking in situational awareness means that you don't really understand what is appropriate at any one particular time. That's the idea of situational awareness, asampajanya. We can talk more about that, some of these terms if you're interested at a later point. But uh, the Buddha says, I have a mindfulness, right? Upatita sati is the Pali word right here. Mindfulness is established. Upatita sati, ahang asmi, I am. There are ascetics and Brahmins who lack samadhi. They have straying minds. We have here vibhanta citta. The mind is straying. The mind is going all over the place. 
Vibanta is also a word which means to disrobe in Pali. Yeah. Yeah, so when you disrobe, you go astray. Just like the mind goes astray when you don't have samadhi, in the same way the monastic go astray when they disrobe. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? You're going astray. So uh, that's kind of the word that is used for disrobal in the Vinya Pitika. But I am accomplished in samadhi. Samadhi sampanno ahangasmi here. Sampanno means accomplished. So he has the samadhi, so the, the Buddha to be already, he has all of these powerful qualities of the mind. There are ascetics and Brahmins who are witless and stupid, <laughs> who frequent the remote lodgings in the wilderness and the forest. Those ascetics and Brahmins, they summon unskillful fear and dread because they of their defect of witlessness and stupidity. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, it kind of makes sense that if you are a bit stupid and dull and all these kind of things, of course it's going to have bad effect on your mind in the, in the forest. Uh, but I don't frequent remote lodgings in the wilderness and the forest being witless and stupid. Uh, I am accomplished in wisdom, panya sampano. I am one of those noble ones who frequent remote lodgings in the wilderness and the forest, accomplished in wisdom. Of course, when we talk about wisdom in this kind of context, we don't really mean the higher wisdom on the Buddhist path. We're not talking about the Buddha-to-be being a noble one yet. We're talking about a kind of lower kind of wisdom. But the wisdom that understands, uh, you know, basically an upright mind that understands things as far as is possible without having the full insight into the nature of reality. So uh, he is already kind of uh, very much on the right track, but not really fully, fully there yet, obviously. Uh, seeing this accomplishment of wisdom in myself, uh, I felt even more unruffled uh, about staying in the forest. Uh, yeah, so this gives you an idea of uh, the kind of some of the qualities that are necessary to stay in the forest. Basically, it means that you have to have a pure mind uh, and you have to have strong spiritual qualities. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, and the more you have of that, uh, and essentially all of this can be summarized really in one word, jhana. Yeah, jhana, absorption. If you have that jhana and absorption, then you have all of these qualities. Uh, Remember one of the things the Buddha says in the suttas about jhana is that if you have jhana, then you have wisdom. If you have wisdom, you have jhana. These are two sides of the same coin. You cannot actually have attain a jhana state without having a high degree of wisdom. It's the wisdom of precisely of giving up a large part of the sensory world. So this means the Buddha to be is ready to stay in the forest. Yeah. But as we shall see, even if you have all of those good qualities, it still can be a bit challenging, which is interesting here. Then I thought, there are certain nights that are recognized as specially portentous. The 14th, the 15th, and the 8th of the fortnight. Yeah? Portentous, like auspicious, yeah? that are special kind of nights with special qualities to them. Here. And these are the portentous nights. And uh, the 14th, 15th, and the 8th fortnight, these are like the full moon and the new moon days. And the 8th is like the half moon, sometimes called the quarter moon, but usually it's really the half moon. Uh, and so, I don't know if you... It's very interesting. When you are in the forest, in the dark forest, on the full moon night, uh, it's very beautiful. Uh, yeah. What was that? You can see with the moonlight. You can walk through the forest when the moonlight moon is up, yeah. And you can see the moon. There's no light pollution. If you're in the city, you can't usually see even the stars because of all the pollution for the light. And this very and this moonlight is a very soft, kind of gentle and beautiful light. It reflects the light from the sun, and it's actually very nice to be in the forest at that time. And you can see why these are called the auspicious nights. And this is the time when the monastics would come out. They would give dhamma talks. All the lay people would come to those Dhamma talks yeah, and they would hang out with the monastics and they would uh, sit maybe meditation all night. That's quite common in places like Thailand, for example, uh, because there are auspicious nights. Yeah. It's very beautiful. Uh. 
And uh, I remember as a child, we used to go skiing in the middle of the night, yeah, when the full moon was out, because when there's snow everywhere, the moon also reflects in the snow, and it's very kind of magical time uh, when that happens. Uh. And then there's the opposite, when the moon, there's no moon, and all there is is starlight. Uh. And when all there is starlight, the forest is incredibly dark, yeah, it's r because the stars only give a tiny bit of light. Uh. And if it is overcast, there's cloudy, uh, that even the stars are gone, then it's pitch black in the forest. Uh. And that's also kind of nice, uh, when it's pitch black, uh, and you're kind of walking around, no idea where you are, the nearest to bump into the tree. Uh. Oops. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and this is kind of what it is like. And that's also actually quite uh, interesting on those nights too, because they're also quite uh, auspicious in a way. So these are the auspicious nights. Uh, and these are the nights, and also they can be quite scary at the same time, yeah, because the full moon, either you get inspired uh, or you become a werewolf. Uh. <laughs> those are the two options, yeah, either you go a bit crazy or you become inspired on those nights. Uh. And this is kind of, so there's kind of a kind of thin edge there, you know, which one, which way am I going to go? Wisdom or, or madness? Kind of not entirely clear which way you're going to go. Uh, and this is why these nights are both scary and inspiring at the same time, especially when it's really dark. Yeah. So, of course, these are the nights that the Buddha, to be, really tests himself to the maximum, right? Uh, on such nights, uh, why don't I stay in awe-inspiring and hair-raising shrines. Yeah, these are the shrines in the forest, the kind of places where people might leave some food for the ghosts and that kind of stuff, right? If this is what happens in the shrines in ancient India and even today in many Buddhist countries. You have a shrine, you leave some food there for the departed. Yeah, the ghosts will come and enjoy that food far away in the parks, the forest and the trees. In such dwelling places, hopefully, I might see that fear and dread. This is the Buddha to be, yeah? He wants to find out whether he can arouse that fear and dread. Even though he's already so pure, uh, he's trying, testing himself to the maximum to see whether he can find the fear and dread. So, this is how. Are you ready for this kind of practice? <laughs> Get plunge deep into the forest, the places where all the ghosts are likely to be, yeah? and then you see what happens when you do that. Uh, and uh, maybe you will feel some fear and dread. Most people will run far away, but, the, but this is the Buddha to be, testing himself to the maximum. Uh. And of course the idea here, what I think the Buddha is trying to do, he is trying to find out whether he still has some defilements, right? Uh, this is really what he is trying to do. Uh. So, um, um, yeah, so this is what he, what is going on here. Uh, and so what do you think? Do you think that the Buddha is going to see some fear and dread? Maybe, maybe even the Buddha-to-be, not the Buddha, the Buddha-to-be I should say. Uh, let's see what happens next. Uh, this is getting very exciting, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> some time later, that is what I did. In other words, he went to those remote hair-raising shrines, yeah, the scary places in the forest. As I was staying there, a deer came by, or a peacock snapped a twig, or the wind rustled the leaves. Yeah, this is what I was saying before. When you are in these very scary places, uh, and you hear what is ordinary sounds, uh, Suddenly they become magnified, yeah? This is kind of just a peacock snapping a twig. These things can become very scary here. Yeah? The wind rustling the leaves, right? That actually can be quite uh, interesting in the forest. Uh, then I thought, uh, is this that fear and dread coming here? Uh, then I thought, uh, why do I always meditate? Or why do I always dwell expecting that fear and terror to come? Uh, why don't I get rid of that fear and terror just as it comes, while remaining just as I am? Instead of just expecting it, let me deal with it, let me overcome this nonsense, yeah, and get out of this, uh, and puri my, purify myself even further, so that none of these things actually can arise. Then that fear and dread came upon me as I was walking. I didn't stand still or sit down or lie down, 
until I had got rid of that fear and dread while walking here. Then that fear and dread came upon me as I was standing here. I didn't walk or sit down or lie down until I got rid of that fear and dread while standing here. The fear and dread came upon me as I was sitting here. I didn't lie down or stand still or walk until I got rid of that fear and dread while sitting here. Then that fear and dread came upon me as I was lying down. I didn't sit up or stand still or walk until I got rid of that fear and dread while lying down. So this is the uh, kind of commitment yeah, of the Buddha to be, the kind of the full commitment, uh, doing things that are really hard to do, uh, plunging into the forest where most people would re be really, really scared to do. Uh, and he does that to test himself to the limit. Uh, and uh, I would really recommend all of you to sometimes test yourself a little bit. Uh, yeah? Not maybe in this way, I don't, you know, we, we, not, we shouldn't try to be Buddhas. If you try to be Buddhas, we're going to have, be in big trouble if we try to do that. Uh, but we should always test ourselves a little bit. Uh, I think the majority of people in the world, we are too limited by fear very often. Uh, we don't allow ourselves to try new things, uh, to test ourselves in new ways, because we are too fearful. We underestimate our own abilities. We tend to underestimate our power and ability to deal with things. Uh, that is what I have always found in my life, uh, underestimating myself. Actually, I can deal with quite a lot. Uh, and I'm sure the same is true for you. You can actually deal with things. Yeah? And other people will often put you down and say, oh, be careful, you can't maybe deal with that. Uh, don't listen too much to other people, because other people will tend to hold you back, even though you are able to deal with things. Uh, so don't be too afraid in this world. Fear stops you from growing. Fear stops you from achieving your dreams, achieving things that are greater than what you normally think. Yeah. Go for it. Try new things. Challenge your defilements. Challenge yourself in new ways. Because that is what makes life interesting. That is what actually gives you the ability to grow. Take some... Uh, uh, take the Buddha as your example. Don't go as far as the Buddha to be, but go forward, do more than you're doing already. Come to Perth, stay at Jana Grove. I'm sometimes surprised. People say, oh, it's too dangerous, Jana Grove, too far away. I'm not sure if I will be able to deal with it. You know, it's really dark there. And they are really scared to come to Australia. It is the least scary place in the world, the Jana Grove, right? It's uh, super duper safe. You know, so. Do little things like that. Do things the way you follow your dreams a little bit. Uh, yeah? Don't allow yourself to be stopped by the little fears in life. Uh, it doesn't have to be John or Grove. It can be anywhere. Do things without allowing yourself to be limited in your life. Because if you do, you're never going to experience anything. You're no, never going to go anywhere. Uh, trust yourself. Trust your ability to deal with things in the world. Uh, then you're going to be... Uh, headed for more, a better life, a richer life, a more spiritual life, a life which is more meaningful. And then I guarantee you, you're going to die more satisfied. Uh, <laughs> it was interesting, this lady I mentioned before, Anita Morjani, this kind of in, she Indian background who lived in Singapore and Hong Kong, she was saying exactly these things. Uh, look up her video, it's a very interesting video. Her name is Anit Anita Morjani, M-O-R-J-A-N-I, and uh, M-O-R-J-A-N-I, and her video is available on TED, TED Talks, TEDx or whatever it's called, uh, and she talks about her experiences. You know the TED Talks, uh, yeah, very famous talks on the internet, yeah, and she talks about her experience, and she said one of the things that she realized after she had her near-death death experience, uh, how she always lived in fear before that. She was afraid of everything in the world. Everything was just fear. And she realized how she was destroying her own life by always living in fear, never daring to kind of live fully. Yeah? And kind of living with all these limits all the time. And she said this was one of the worst things about life. And we should, and she realized actually we need to just express ourselves to kind of live more fully. Otherwise, uh, life is never complete, never satisfying. Uh. So please don't allow yourself to be limited in this way. Uh. And then, as you do these things, life becomes more satisfying, more, f more complete, and more, and more uh, better as a consequence. And you will actually make more progress on the spiritual path as well, if you do that. Uh. 
So uh, follow the Buddha's example here. Uh, don't hold back. Do things where you are out of your depth. Don't be afraid of being out of your depth sometimes. Yeah. Do things where you feel that your little me, maybe I can't do it. Of course you can do it. Try it. See what happens. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is that you fail. And if you fail, big deal, right? Uh, the worst thing that can happen is that you die. And if you die, you are a good person. You go to a good destination anyway, so you're okay here. <laughs> Sometimes if you think about the worst thing that can happen to you and that you can deal with that, uh, then there is no issue anymore. Huh? All right. So this is what the Buddha did. Yeah? And he, he went so far and he, he didn't give up until he overcame these things. He really took it all the way. Huh? There are some ascetics and Brahmins uh, who perceive that it's day when in fact it's night. Huh? or perceive that it's night when in fact it is day. This meditation of theirs is delusion, I say. I perceive that it's night when in fact it is night. I perceive that it's day when in fact it is day. The idea here is that there are some people who are deluded. They don't see things right. They see black as white and white as black. They don't really have a proper perception of reality. Uh, but the Buddha, he faces things completely. The Buddha to be, because he faces things completely, that is why he's able to overcome his delusion. Uh, and if there's anyone of whom it might be rightly said uh, that the being not liable to delusion has arisen in the world for the welfare and happiness of the people, for the compassion for the world, for the benefit, welfare and happiness of gods and humans, uh, it is of me that this should be said. Uh, yeah, a being not liable to delusion is the Buddha to be. This is the superpower of the Buddha. This is why the Buddha to be is able to find awakening, because he is able to actually not be deluded by anything, facing reality squarely. Yeah? This is what this is about. Uh, this is such an important thing. Yeah? And um, this is what we were talking about yesterday. It was interesting yesterday when we had that question about this person who was uh, worried when I was saying that we should face our own old age. Yeah, you look at yourself in the mirror instead of trying to run away from that old age, running away from that sickness. Uh, yeah? We should face it a little bit because when we face it, we are not deluding ourselves. This is similar to what we are seeing here. Huh? And uh, that person was saying, oh, does that mean we shouldn't care about our body and all of these kind of things? But it is really about this idea of not being deluded about reality, being as seeing things as clearly as we possibly can. Because when we are not deluded, then we can take, make good decisions about what we should be doing with our lives. If we choose delusion all the time, we choose not to see reality, it means that we are hiding behind things and we will never really be able to make really good decisions about what is important in life. But the point is, to be able to face delusion, you have to have a certain strength inside of you. If you haven't got that strength and then you try to face delusion, actually it's going to be very despairing and very difficult for you. You're not ready to face reality. Yeah, you know what I mean? If you face too much suffering in your life and you haven't got the inner strength to deal with it, actually it can drive you crazy as a consequence. So that what we're trying to do then on the spiritual path is on the one hand we build up good qualities so we feel stable, we feel solid, we feel strong, we feel that we have a source of happiness within that can withstand the problems of the world. So on the one hand, we build up the good qualities and we build up a sense of independence and resilience in the world. That resilience and independence are very, very important to be able to deal with the realities. And then when we build up those good qualities that make us resilient and stable and independent, then we have the ability to deal with the non-delusion and seeing reality as it actually is. So don't try to be non-deluded and seeing reality if you are not ready, yeah? if your mind isn't strong enough. If you try when your mind isn't strong enough, it's not going to work. So things have to work in tandem. 
And this is also why, if you want to have really profound insight into the nature of reality, which basically means the ability to see non-self and these kind of things, uh, which is the deepest kind of insights on the Buddhist path, uh, this is why you need samadhi to be able to do that. Uh, because samadhi gives you the strength of mind, uh, the power, the ability to deal with things that are incredibly hard to see. Uh, you have the independence, uh, you have the imperturbability, uh, to be able to deal with very difficult things. Uh, that is the purpose of samadhi. Uh. So do things in tandem, right? Do things in the right way. Uh. See, be non-deluded, just like the Buddha is, uh, so that you can make good decisions in your life. Don't try to hide reality. If we, if we look away from reality as it actually is, it's actually a very bad idea, because it destroys our life eventually. Uh. But make sure that you're able to deal with it by building up good qualities. Uh then you're dealing with this in the right way. Huh? Find that the balance. Balance is so important in the world. Huh? If you don't live with balance, huh? if you get out of balance, out of culture, huh? then you're in trouble as a consequence. Huh? Okay, let's do a little bit of meditation again. Huh?
<coughs> okay. All right. So, any questions, uh, please? Uh, any uh, comments? Uh, Good afternoon, Ajahn. Good afternoon. Uh, I have this question regarding going into seclusion mm. and uh, uh, living in solitude in the forest. Is there a possibility where there's a very thin line here? lay person like me and a lot of my Kalenam meters mm. may fall into a situation where we may turn into an introvert and it's, it's like a very fine line because we have not purified our huh. our mind yet we are we are not in samadhi yet. We have not uh, purified our body, speech, and mind. Yeah. So, is there a danger for us to move in that direction? To, to, you mean to go crazy or to be to to yeah. whatever? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Introverts or crazy? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Well, there, there is always that Thank danger. You. There is always that danger there, and that's why. You know, when we talk about going into solitude, there are different degrees of going into solitude. Uh, and one degree is to go to a retreat center, yeah? And that is already a little bit of solitude because you get out of your ordinary life, your ordinary things, uh, and because of that, getting away from that, uh, that is already uh, what we talk, we talk about citta viveka. Citta viveka is the seclusion of the mind. It is secluded from the ordinary senses uh, and the ordinary worldly things. Uh, that's already a positive thing. So if you come to a place like Jana Grove, you are away from your ordinary life. You get your own room, your own bathroom, but there are people around. You're not completely by yourself. You're not left completely to your own devices. And that is, so that is kind of a, you know, a halfway house. So you do things gradually, right? You do things slowly, and then you see how it works. Or you can come and stay in a monastery for a while. In a monastery, there are usually people around. You can almost choose exactly how much interaction you want to have uh, when you stay in a monastery. Uh, so you have the opportunity to kind of you know, feel what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Uh, that's what I would recommend. And make sure you have a good teacher around, someone you can consult with, uh, you can ask questions of, uh, you can ask them, am I crazy now or not? <laughs> am I crazy or enlightened? I'm not sure. One of the two. <laughs> If you think you are either crazy or enlightened, usually you're crazy. <laughs> so uh, it's not not to be too concerned. As long as you have common sense, you're going to be okay. Huh? And the way to measure these things in your meditation is to feel how does the meditation feel. Huh? And if your meditation feels good, then you are. Your mind is quite clear. You're gaining a bit of happiness and joy. You're gaining good qualities. Then usually you're okay. Huh? But if you feel that your meditation, you're becoming deluded and confused and maybe you, lots of desires and all kind of things, well then that is when you should stop the meditation because not giving the right results. So as long as you have common sense, you're going to go a long way, not have to be too concerned. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, dear Chan. Bobby. What about uh, graveyard meditation? Graveyard meditation, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, you can try that, uh, and that is uh, and yet one of the nice things about graveyard meditation. Often you get left in peace; no one else comes into the graveyard, so you're, you're kind of you. You get a lot of solitude that way. Uh. So that can be nice, and it also is a reminder of death, yeah, because death is around you. So it's a reminder. So it can be very peaceful. So try some of these things out. Uh. Have you done that here at the BGF? No, you haven't. Okay, Ch try it out. See what happens. Uh. Find a graveyard far away in the forest, yeah? A really scary graveyard somewhere. 
something that has been swallowed up by the jungle. You make a path through. You find this ancient graveyard. You take the whole BGF there, yeah, and you got it. <laughs> that is the path. I, I was in Melbourne not so long ago, and in Melbourne, this monastery is about a couple of hours outside of Melbourne, and it's kind of very close to the forest. And when you walk into the forest, there's an ancient cemetery in the middle of the forest there. It's true. And uh, some of the, I think some of the, I think actually, I wonder if it was, uh, I think many of the people there had names, Chinese names actually. There may have been a lot of Chinese people in that era. Ch Chinese people of Chinese background, they came to Australia quite early. Some of them came already 200 years ago and they were part of the gold, the gold mining and this kind of things down there. Uh. And so there's this ancient cemetery in the forest there, yeah? And I thought, wow, this is really cool. This is the kind of place you want to meditate in, right? <laughs> To see if we can find something similar here in Malaysia, and then that would be really, 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 really nice. Uh, so yeah, good, good, good thinking, Bobby. You are. This is why you are the leader of the crowd here. Yeah. <laughs> Achan, uh, uh, new graveyard safer or old graveyard safer? Uh, old, old, old graveyard, much better, right? Uh, I, I, no, actually, maybe, maybe a mixture because the new graveyard, uh, maybe there's more, ch more chances of ghosts on the new graveyard. I was thinking. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I don't know. Try try it and see what see what works the best. Uh, let's see 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 what happens. <laughs> yeah, Ajahn, I think you were saying that it'd be good once in a while. We need to scare ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking, what's yeah. the point of doing that? Is it uh, to develop the understanding that all this? All these are due to our female imagination. The, what? The All the scary things are due to our female imagination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. by scaring ourselves once in a while, and we develop ability to counter the fear. Is, is, is it the whole purpose of doing that? Yeah, I, I, but the, the, the purpose is not to develop fear as such. The purpose is really to see if you have any defilements. Yeah, that's kind of the purpose. Uh, and uh, for, for most people, it's not necessary because for most people, are not at the same level as the Buddha to be. He's already very advanced in his practice, you know. So for most people, it's not actually required. But if you enjoy meditation practice, sometimes it can be nice to go somewhere far away, even if it is a little bit scary, you know. But uh, so I would say for most people, enough challenges in daily life to kind of, you know, keep the mind pure and all these kind of things. So this is really quite extreme. The reason I'm looking at it is just to kind of to talk a bit about Dhamma around around this uh, issue uh, and not so much that I, th I think people should do exactly this. That's not really the point. Uh, the point is just that if you have a very pure mind, uh, very good c things come with that. The fact that you're never scared, you're never fearful uh, and you have this ability to uh, you know, live a life to a very kind of high ability. You can have samadhi by yourself in the forest and all these kind of all these positive things come with that. Uh, so uh, I don't think I would recommend this particular practice for most people. Uh, but uh, yeah, but sometimes it is good to confront, you know, your uh, demons and your fears a little bit to see what is there and to see what happens, uh, you know, not to be too conservative and too uh, fearful in life to hold yourself back a little bit. Uh, I, I believe in challenging oneself. Uh, if you never challenge yourself, uh, you never grow. Uh, so it's important. Uh, yeah. No, no, one monk is always challenges us to do this practice. Say, imagine you go to a room yeah. alone. Yeah, yeah. You just imagine. You say to yourself, there's something behind you. <laughs> <laughs> say, you guarantee you'll be feeling something behind you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, good. Yeah. Is that a good practice? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I just want to um, share about ghost stories. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So, now you can. You should take the seat up here, actually, because this, this is important. This is important. <laughs> well, uh, when I was growing up, you know, we always, you know, the people always talk about ghosts and stuff. When I was young, I was also scared <laughs> of ghosts. You know, when we go in the dark and. Uh, have to have somebody with us, but you know, since I've been ordained for many years now and been practicing at all, and it seemed that that fear. I I don't do anything about the fear. I just you know when I'm 
feel like I live alone in my place. You know, no, nobody's around at night. You know, I leave my kuti and have big sala and some other kuti. So at night, completely silent. I don't turn on the light or anything. Maybe five minutes light, turn on the light, and completely in the dark. So I'm, in, you know, just to be, I just set my mind to, you know, to the moment, not thinking about. Fear is the future, right? More like in the future, what's going to happen? You know? yeah. I just, you know, walk, go sleep. Mm. And uh, <laughs> yeah, then I sleep really well, you know, <laughs> deep sleep. You know, I mean, usually, I never heard, heard ha hardly anything, but some night I could hear. In, I had lived next to the sala, I have a big sala. And uh, some night it woke me up like somebody had party up there. <laughs> a lot of noise, <laughs> you know. Like I thought maybe in my uh, nephew's house. In my nephew's house, not that near. It's like uh, 100 meters away. I thought maybe they have a party there. But I didn't think so. A few nights I heard, you know, it woke me up. I thought like, like a you know, woman and men were talking very loud, <laughs> having party. And then I didn't pay attention and I fell back to sleep. <laughs> but this, this is just last month and uh, nothing ever happened uh, to me before that's so clear. I came back from uh, visiting uh, Pikuni in the northeast. And when I came back the the first morning, I usually set up the alarm at four thirty to wake up. But I walk. I usually, you know, wake up before the alarm. And before that four thirty, I heard the voice, the woman's voice. It said, "Nimon ka," you know, in Thai, we mean "Nimon" means like, you know, the churn. Invitation. You know, invitation. Invitation. Yeah. I really heard that voice, and I never heard it so clear like that. And she was, in fact, she found me like next to my bed. <laughs> huh? No, I just listen and say, where's that voice come from? You know? And nobody's there. But I, it seemed like she was right next to my bed. Just, uh, what else? <laughs> <laughs> What else do you have? Because nobody lives here, you know. Nobody's here. But uh, it's a little boy, it's a woman's boy, like kind of nice, kind of sound. Nimon ka. You know. <laughs> it's kind of strange, you know. And I never, uh, you know, had this kind of, such a clear experience here, you know, the real voice. If it's somebody else around, maybe, oh, they're calling me or something, but nobody's around. <coughs> so, you know, real. Nice story. And many story ghosts about my place, but somebody else saw it, but I didn't so see <laughs> Great, thank you so, so much. So, you thank know, you. you know, there's real ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Venerable. So, uh, that's wonderful. So, please. Tell more ghost stories because this is really good fun, you know. So, but let's have a break now for half an hour, and we'll see you back again at a quarter to five. Yeah?